Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of debate. Um, these are my, no, no disclosures to this presentation. Actually, I've given some educational talks. So we're going to go talk a little bit about radial versus femoral, but you've already witnessed a very nice uh, debate about that, so I'm not going to be debating, just talking a little bit of facts. We'll talk mainly about ultrasound-assisted vascular access, and throughout the talk, I just want to give some tips and tricks on how to best you know, approach vascular access, at least in my opinion. Then we'll give you a little bit update about the growing group that we, for you, those of you who were here last year, we talked a little bit about. So as you know, cardiac catheterization begins and ends with vascular access management. So it's not only the first step, but it's also the last step. Everything can go great during the case. Before the case, you can have the best person obtaining access and the best results with that, but then somebody pulls the sheet, doesn't hold enough pressure, and you have major complications. So really, the case is not over until the patient is good and discharged home. So that's why this becomes an important issue. Now, femoral versus radial. These are completely two separate you know, vascular access sites. There are advantages and disadvantages to each site. Radial is a great access site. It does decrease complications. I do believe in that. However, not every patient can have a radial uh, access for many procedures that you've seen throughout the day today and yesterday. Uh, the femoral access is a much bigger access. Uh, no matter what we do, whether we're doing coronaries or peripherals or structurals, it still is an important access for us. Now, this is a very gross description who can and who can get, who has advantages to get radial access and who has the more advantages to get the femoral access. In general, if you are not very experienced with radial, you're going to have much more cumbersome time doing the procedure. But you have to do enough to become proficient because it is an important access. On the other hand, some people who are very high risk for bleeding, they absolutely need to be uh, maybe considered for radial access because we do need to decrease the bleeding risk. This is from a recent study by Dr. Rao and his colleague, and it very clearly showed the bleeding rates when you look at radial um, in the high-risk group are going to be much less. And mortality, same thing. This is still debatable, but in some patient population, it is decreasing uh, mortality when you do radial for these people who are on a lot of anticoagulation and with high-risk features. Now, this came up uh, also last year, so I have just the most updated stuff for you. This is talking about um, the radial paradox. So this, I know Dr. Rao stepped out, but he hates the study. I know that, and I know that because he wrote a very nice and enlightening editorial about it. But I don't put it here because I believe in necessary in this data, but I do think there's a take-home message from this data, which to me is very important. I know for a fact people who have 100% radial programs, uh, and I'll tell you the more radials we do, um, and if you train your fellows about radials 100% of time, if they go out and start wanting to do femoral, they might not have the skills to do femoral. I believe in that. And what I believe in more is your staff, the nursing staff, the CCU staff, if they are all seeing 100% closure device for femorals and 100% radials, when this eight French sheath comes and they have an issue to hold pressure, they won't even have enough experience to do that. So your femoral complications may go up. I say may because I don't have the data to support it. I don't think this data is strong enough. It's like, uh, you know, you're comparing apple and oranges. Both are fruits, but they're not really the same. So this is two cohorts. One is a historic cohort. One is a new cohort. And the new cohort had much more radial access. And they said, well, the people that had femoral access in the new cohort, whether it was because of diagnostic cath or interventions, had actually more complications. And they blamed that on the radial paradox. The more radial you're doing, the less experience you are with femoral. Again, I'm not saying this is necessarily a very strong data. And they, there are a lo lot of limitations. But it's something to think about. Other thing to think about when you're doing radial, which we discussed, radiation dose, contrast, the complex CTOs, operator's experience, and radial does have its own complications. It does not come complication free. So what if you want to do femoral? So I'm not trying to convince you to do femoral. I'm saying if you have to do it, what is the best way, at least in my opinion, to approach the femoral, the femoral axis? As you can see there, what you really want to have, you want to have the sheath 
kind of at the level of the middle of the head of the femur or maybe just a little bit below that. This will be below the most inferior deflection of the inferior epigastric artery, which is IEA over there that you can see. Uh, and you want to stay above the um, bifurcation. I've, lim I've lined the two, the, the yellow lines, there's a zone one and zone two. Zone one represents an area where you don't want your sheath to be. Even though it's still above the femoral head, the sheath is above the most inferior deflection of the inferior epigastric artery, it's gonna increase your risk of bleeding, and this is the worst kind of bleeding because you can increase the risk of retroperitoneal bleed, which actually can be deadly. Now, in zone two, it's still the common femoral artery because it's before it bifurcates. However, it's below the most inferior border of the head of the femur. So in these patients, you don't have a good way to hold good pressure. If you don't do a closure device or if closure device fails or if patient is not a candidate for closure device and you have to hold pressure, um, you're not gonna have that bone to support you when you hold pressure. So the risk of pseudoaneurysms, AV fistulas, hematomas is gonna be higher. So the ideal access site where would be right in the middle of the head of the femur. Now, sometimes we have high bifurcations. And these, if you don't have a previous angiogram, and I advise every one of you, if you have a case to do, to go back and look at the previous access site because it can absolutely help you know what to expect, what to know. Something like this, you know, you probably need ultrasound to get it if you absolutely have to go femoral. If you can go radial, do that. But we know uh, from previous data that you know, a lot of patients have their bifurcation at or even below, uh, at or even above the middle of the head of the femur. And this you cannot see if you don't have a previous angiogram and there's no way to predict it. Now we all know access site complications are, not, are here to stay, hopefully not, but I know they are. Uh, and these are some of the complications that we see. So the techniques that we use, you, a lot of people, and I actually randomized 1,000 patients to study if this technique was good or not. You locate the inferior border of the head of the femur and you start accessing there. The problem with this technique, and I've learned it as I, you know, as I matured in this field, is that if you put the, the, your hemostat right there and the patient is very thin, doesn't have a lot of subcutaneous tissue and you start accessing with the needle right there, you're gonna hit the artery way lower than the middle of the head of the femur and that's gonna be a problem. Now if the patient is actually a little bit heavier and has a lot of subcutaneous tissue and you put your uh, you know, hemostat right there and you start accessing at the same angle, 45 degree angle, by the time you hit the artery, you're gonna way, be way above the middle of the head of the femur and now you're gonna increase your risk of bleeding. So that's also not the best approach to take. Now what about micropuncture needle? So this has been, uh, actually there's publications from Dr. Turi and others on, on just accessing the artery and looking where it is with fluoroscopy, just you do like one second fluoroscopy after you put the wire in and see if you like where it is or not. Now the, the I don't have a pointer here, but, um, sorry, oh yeah. So right here where the transition is between the needle and the wire, so where the transition between the needle and the wire is, you know that right here is where this needle entered the artery. And if you like where it is, you keep the wire, you put your sheath up. If you don't like where it is, you can withdraw the needle, withdraw the wire, hold pressure for two, three minutes, and then reaccess and check again. So this can be helpful. Do I have data to support this? Well, there were some studies being done with micropuncture, but they were, I mean, you need hundreds and thousands of patients, so they were both halted because there were not enough complications to do. So now we come to ultrasound. Why use of ultrasound? It can enhance your optimal puncture site placement, reduce access site complications. You can do the access with a single puncture first pass and single wall, which will help you put closure devices. And I mentioned closure devices because now we have registry and data from randomized study that actually use of angiomax and maybe closure devices may be superior to not using them to decrease complications. We've always thought of closure devices as they don't affect complications. Now data are emerging that they may, but you know, that's another, another talk. Anyway, you can avoid branches, calcifications, lesions if there are some in the common femoral artery, and of course you can increase the suitability of closure devices. Now, what machine to use? Any machine that you have can work. There are different kinds of machine. You just wanna make sure you have good high quality images. Some machines have needle um, you know, track that you, you can use this to just track your needle. And some are freehand where the needle, you have to hold it. 
the most important thing you, you need to do is uh, when you use that ultrasound is to decide where you want to put it. Put it and leave it perpendicular to the artery. Try not to move it up and down and try to make the tip of the needle get to where your, your um, ultrasound beam is in that plane. If you're getting access and you see blood return but you're not seeing the ultrasound needle, your needle is somewhere other than where it's supposed to be. So this is, for example, if you want to be very safe, you've never used ultrasound, you can do it this way. This is a patient I did before I got here on Friday, so I just wanted to make sure just to give you an example. You can locate the lower and the upper head of the femur borders and just mark it. And then you can put the ultrasound perpendicular right there in the middle between the two because you know this is the middle of the head of the femur. Get access under ultrasound with micropuncture. And this is what you would see with ultrasound. You can see the bifurcation. If the bifurcation is there, you can move, per while you're perpendicular, you just move up a little bit until you don't see you can, uh, the bifurcation anymore. You can absolutely see the needle going in the anterior wall of the artery. We call it tenting. And then when it comes in and you see blood return, you drop the ultrasound, you put the wire. And this is a one up, and you can go longitudinal view when the wire is in, see if the wire is good, the subintimal, going through lesions if you need to. Now, because we obtained access with micropuncture, you can double check if you want, and you can see the access is exactly in the middle of the head of the femur. And we take an angiogram, and it's exactly where we want it to be, perfect access, I'm happy. And when you look at the sheath, you look at the sheath entry site is not in the middle. So you don't want to start accessing your needle in the middle because then it's gonna to be too high. So that's why I was trying to show you with this cartoon, it depends on the subcutaneous tissue and stuff. But if you're doing with ultrasound and you actually see your needle come to where the ultrasound beam is right in the middle, you know the entry point is gonna be in the middle of the head of the femur, but the sheath entry site may be very low. Now remember, I don't know if a lot of you know this, I didn't until recently, there are two kinds of micropuncture, there's one, uh, that's uh, braided, the tip of it, and that's the one encircled and the black on the tip. That is actually specifically for ultrasound. It has small laser cuts in it and it reflects the sound wave much better because ultrasound is very difficult to see. Uh, the micropuncture needle is very difficult to see under ultrasound, but these braided ones will help you a lot. Now, we know from a big study we did that you know it, uh, ultrasound can improve your access in people with high bifurcations and can decrease your number of attempts to obtain access. First pass success rate is higher, venipuncture is higher, and time to sheath um, uh, insertion is actually lower. That is if the ultrasound is ready for you to use at the beginning of the case, you're not stopping to get it ready. Um, and mainly we show the decrease in the hematomas. Uh, of course, it, we were not powered to show, even though it was close to 1,000 patients, it was still not powered to show complications. Now, this is a meta-analysis. Our study, uh, the CETO 2010, is one of the biggest, but there's been others. So this is a meta-analysis that show you exactly the same thing I talked about. You know, first pass success rate is better with ultrasound. Um, the number of attempts is better with ultrasound. Uh, definitely the time to, uh, uh, time to get the sheath in successfully and the rate of venipunctures are much better as well as the rate of hematomas and to total complications. Now, remember the numbers are not humongous, maybe not all reach statistical significance, but this was enough at least in Europe to count as the ultrasound as, the, um, as a if, you know, very good recommendation, level of evidence A, uh, strength of recommendation is very strong to be used for any vascular access. It also can be used in the radial artery. It might not be needed as much, but if you have difficulty in the radial artery or like we saw in the, um, you know, dorsalis pedis, posterior tibial, all these arteries, it's, it's great to use. And it has the same results there as well. So this is why we use ultrasound. I just, just for benefit of time, I wanna go to this. So as I said at the beginning, no matter how good you are of an operator, if your team is not as good complications are gonna happen. This is a not a one mind show. And I learned this a lot. I was actually blessed <laughs> in our VA, you know, our techs and, um, and uh, nurses are long-term in the cath lab. They don't rotate as much. So they have vascular access and regress like down to, uh, to, to very good. They, we, we rarely have complications. I moved over three years ago to the university site and almost every other case is a problem. I mean, what's happening? People don't know how to pull sheet here, so I had to investigate. And you find that the policy of the hospital says a nurse can be trained to pull sheath if they've witnessed one or two and they've pulled only three. I said, wait, 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 you're telling me like these sheets I'm putting, if a nurse has pulled only three, they can pull them on their own now? 
So we had to change the policy. And after that, we have to, you know, just kind of have a growing group we call with zero tolerance. Every case that gets bleeding gets reviewed. We go root cause analysis. And here recently, I'll give you another example. Found out that there was a big communication gap between the cath lab nurses and the CCU nurses. All are great nurses. But the cath lab said, hey, pull the sheath in the unit. The nurse in the unit heard put the pull the sheath on arrival. The patient had Lovenox from an outside facility for a STEMI. Nobody checked the physician orders. Things like that happen. So no matter how good you are, you have a major complication. So I said, I'm done with verbal communication about sheath. You know? So part of the group to improve the process, let's get this sheet out. You know, the cath lab nurse has to decide what they want to do, sign it, and as well as the floor nurses. And now I don't want anybody said, he said, she said, we want to decrease these complications. So it cannot just be something you do in the cath lab. You can do best operator and still have a lot of complications. You really have to deal with everything. I was hoping this book would be published before this conference to give the uh, Dr. Banerjee and Bulakis some copies to give away, but it will be in June. And I'll be happy to, uh, whether they invite me or not again next year, to provide them with a lot of <laughs> copies to give out. Uh, because this is the first actually book just dedicated to arterial venous axis and encompasses axis and all over the body, not only femoral and radial. Uh, great chapters on pediatric axis and ultrasound axis. So hopefully we'll have some of these out for you soon. Thank you very much.